It's all quiet in the underground bunker. Doors closed, locks bolted. But the great one isn't just resting on his laurels. He's making sure your weekend is even better by giving you his best. This is the best of Mark Levin. I told you I was going on a mission. How many of you had figured out it's probably Israel. But I don't forecast exactly what I'm doing for obvious reasons. I'm not liked everywhere. And Mr. Producer, there's some people in the Middle East who might not like me either. And so, uh, particularly when I have some of the family with me, I can't pinpoint and announce exactly what I'm doing. And uh, we had a terrific man protecting us. He had an automatic weapon. We'll just say his name was Gabriel, and he was terrific. And I'll get into this a little bit with you, because I did it to report to you. It's one thing to talk about what's going on in the Middle East. It's quite another to experience it. We experienced it a little bit more than I expected we would, but we did, and so be it. And what I realized is how much of the reporting is BS when things are taking place in the Middle East. Complete BS. Even from some people who are reporting from there. Most of them aren't, but some are. Now, I had some meetings over there. I'm not going to get into them in specifics. With some very uh, significant people. Learned a great deal. And this is why I come behind this microphone with knowledge on these subjects. Not just shoot from the hip. And by the way, I want to also discuss tonight this impeachment fraud that took place. I want to also discuss tonight the Trump case, the Speaker of the House, and the funding for various allies, as well as the hearings that took place on anti-Semitism. We have a lot to cover. I just got back, obviously, literally got back uh, about five hours ago. And so, uh, first of all, the people of Israel... Don't all think the same way. Don't all practice their faith the same way. Some don't practice their faith at all. There are also Arab Israelis and other Israelis. They're Christians who live in Israel. It is a majority Jewish state, but it is a diverse state. And you will see many minorities there. You will see a lot of Ethiopians, because Israel some time ago... Uh, had a refugee lift from Ethiopia to Israel because the Ethiopian Jews were were being, as you can imagine, murdered and attacked. And so it's it is quite a melting pot in that sense. And when you look at the IDF, the IDF is filled with people of all backgrounds, all colors, all denominations, um, and that is true. One of the things I knew, but certainly was underscored when we were there, is the Israeli people are warriors. By that, <coughs> excuse me, by that I mean they will defend their country. Whether Biden wants them to defend it or not, whether Blinken wants them to defend it or not, regardless of what they say on CNN and MSNBC and the pages of the New York Times, it doesn't matter. They have nowhere to go. This is it. And they also know that this is their homeland. Very few people around the world can say that they can, they can literally identify their history going back over 4,000 years. Well, the Jews can. The Palestinians can't because they didn't even exist 200 years ago or 150 years ago. It's a whole nomenclature thing. They do know what's going on in the United States. They're quite concerned about the massive spread of anti-Semitism in our country. They're quite concerned about the lack of support or the uh, sort of the, uh, the support and the no support that's coming out of certain elements within the United States. They see what you see. They do listen to this station. I should say this program in Israel via the podcast and direct streaming. And of course, they have Fox, among other stations in Israel. 
Um, it is a vibrant country, but it's also a country that is different. What do I mean by that? We stayed in two different hotels, and you will have signs in different parts of the hotel on every floor that has the word shelter in bold and an arrow. So you're always mindful that you, you may have to run to a shelter because there might be an attack. This is constant in that country. It is constant. I want you to think about how that would work if you or we were under constant threat and missile sirens going off. And how that would be for your kids and your grandkids. They're not firing missiles willy-nilly. Whistles are willy-nilly being fired at them. Also, uh, you will see soldiers in the streets. It's not an overbearing presence, but very young people with rifles on their shoulders and so forth and pistols on their hips uh, walking certain of the streets, uh, whether it's in the old city of Jerusalem or other parts of the country. And they are starting to loosen their very strict gun rules so more and more citizens can obviously carry guns. I don't think they're loose enough from my perspective, but there you go. Many of the people there speak beautiful English. It is a completely westernized open society. Unlike what surrounds them which are throwbacks to the 9th century, even the 7th century. Which are terrorist organizations and regimes even the Arabs want nothing to do with. And so you have this this conflict between a, uh, a Western civilization, a democracy, people who believe in life, and believe in freedom versus a throwback uh, ideology in one form or another that could care less about freedom, the individual, or democracy, and have a centralized ideology, and if you don't comply, then they kill you, or they oppose you, or they do something to you, because they don't let it sit. And that includes Muslims who don't believe in terrorism. They are targeted in the Middle East. I'm watching this guy, McKenzie, who was one of the architects of the horrific surrender in Afghanistan. He was apparently head of the uh, CENTCOM at one point. And these guys who are failures as generals, they're brought on TV to give counsel and advice and input on what Israel should do or Ukraine should do or Taiwan should do. It's really baffling to me. McKenzie and Milley, even though they pointed out that they didn't agree with what Biden told them to do and Blinken told them to do, should be hanging their heads in shame for the rest of their lives. They should have resigned in opposition to what was taking place. We've had generals who have done that. Sing Lob is a perfect example. And uh, I wrote some notes here. He was on Fox on the Cavuto show with respect to Israel. They should take the win. Now, that's Biden. Take what win? Folks, 300 missiles were shot at, at their cities. My wife, Julie, my mother-in-law, my stepson and I experienced it. Now, they were shot out of the sky but they were shot at their country. Nobody says Iran should play defense. Those were offensive missile firings at the state of Israel. Now, I'm pretty sick and tired of people telling them what to do, but we wouldn't tolerate that for two seconds, and you wouldn't tolerate it if our government tolerated it. And some general... Retired, who's a complete loser, goes on TV, take the win. For his criticism of Biden in Afghanistan, he's repeating Biden right now. 
He suggests it's hard for Israel to take the victory, to accept victory. Accept victory? Those missile silos still exist. Those threats still exist. He says Israel's pretty much on its own. The UN and the rest of the world are telling them don't do anything precipitous. What makes them think they're going to do something precipitous? If they do something, do something. That is hard and specific and does destruction. That's not precipitous. Says Israel has to balance its support from other countries. All these conditions placed on a country that's trying to defend itself. And a people trying to defend itself, their, themselves. From a guy who surrendered in Afghanistan caused he, not alone, but the others, 13 of our soldiers to be killed. God knows how many American citizens are there. Nobody even talks about it. Nobody. But I got to thinking, I went on a couple of shows, they called me when I was there on Saturday, sitting in the, uh, I didn't go to the shelter. My wife didn't go to the shelter. We went to the parking lot under the hotel and uh, or right outside the parking lot. And I was stewing. I was furious that I was sitting there. First of all, I wished I could do something, which obviously I couldn't. But I was pissed at the fact that I was there. And I got to thinking about all this. I was reading information that was coming fresh over the transom from legitimate sources in the Middle East before they got to the United States. And I posted it for you. And I said, I've been doing a lot of thinking about the lunacy of Biden's Iran policy. Biden's position refusing to support Israel from taking offensive military action against Iran means that Biden will not support, listen, this is important, any military strikes against Iran's nuclear facilities, and that Iran will have a functioning nuclear arsenal with which to threaten the United States, Israel, the Arab world, and the rest of the world without fear of military attack. Now, why did I write that? Because that was the time for Biden to talk to Netanyahu about taking out those nuclear sites. We have our military there. We would back them up. They can take them out, and that would be that. But instead, he immediately says, no, no offense. No offensive military action. How many military or militaries around the world would say, okay, that's fine. No offensive military action when you're surrounded by Islamist terrorists funded by Iran, which is funded by the United States. How, 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 I mean, you're surrounded. This is a country of about 13 million, 7 million Jews, give or take, by a billion people. And everybody keeps saying Hezbollah has 150,000 precision missiles. Iran triggered October 7th. Biden paid for it. The best time for Israel to have hit Iran's nuclear sites with critical U.S. support would have been now, I wrote, meaning some days back. Biden's appeasement of Iran and intentional funding of Iran, lack of deterrence against Iran and efforts to crippling Israel's efforts to neutralize Iran's military and terrorist operations ensures that Islamist fundamentalist Iran will become a nuclear power. Then what? And once that occurs, there will be few options to limit Iran's ambitions short of a devastating confrontation with frightening risks. What will we do if Iran closes the Red Sea and other navigable waters used to transport oil? And it will also contribute even further to the firepower of China, Russia, North Korea, Iran access and cause other Middle East countries to acquire nuclear weapons. This is the world Biden and Blinken are creating while sanctimoniously lecturing about their efforts to de-escalate military confrontations. Again, the crucial point is that Biden has not only signaled to Iran that no effective action will be taken to stop its nuclear program, but Biden has actually acted to ensure that Iran's final path to building nuclear weapons is open and clear. Mark Levin. Making your weekend even better. 
This is the best of Mark Levin. You know, to be intentionally funding Iran and its terrorist regime and its nuclear program, that's what's happening. Intentionally. And then to appease Iran, obviously, is going to lead to a massive problem. And that's what is meant by no support for offensive military action against Iran by Israel. The idea that missile defenses are the, <laughs> are the answer to preventing offensive strikes against Israel or any country is lunacy. On its face, it's illogical. It is a deterrent under certain circumstances, maybe in many. But ultimately, you don't stop missile attacks by chasing another country's missiles. You stop missile attacks with certainty by destroying that country's capacity for launching missiles and or deterring such attacks by subjecting that country to punishing offensive military attacks. And despite Biden's massive and current propaganda operation to the contrary, facts are facts. It's beyond debate that the duplicitous to create the events that took place in the skies over Israel a few nights ago. It's what I posted. And of course, Israel was in the dark about it. This is the same Biden regime that outrageously demands tactical approval over Iran's battlefield decisions. Why? Because it wouldn't have gone along. Israel's not going to go along with treachery that puts its people through such heinous subterfuge. Think about how morally corrupt, among other things, the Biden regime's actions truly are. Now, what am I talking about? Ladies and gentlemen, it's a report out of the Middle East. I believe it was in the Jerusalem Post. That Iran gave a heads up to Iraq, Turkey, and Jordan. And all three gave a heads up to the United States. What Iran was going to do and when they were going to do it. The Biden regime denies it. Now, Biden had the king of Jordan next to his side a couple months ago to trash Israel. Why would Jordan lie about this? In fact, why would Turkey and Iraq lie about it as detestable as that mass murder is in Turkey? But why would he lie about it? There's no, they have nothing to gain from that. And apparently the Biden administration said back, okay, but don't, you know, that's kind of got to be the limits to what you can do. And so... That's one of the reasons we were repositioning some of our ships, some of our capabilities in the Middle East, because they were tipped off. But they didn't tell the Israelis. Now, Biden and the Iranian regime sympathizer Blinken coordinated with Iran over the timing, types of missiles, and even Iranian propaganda even before the first missile was intercepted. The Iranian mouthpiece at the UN said, this is it, this is all we're going to do, this should put an end to it. And so everybody had the message, like a conga line of rocket dancers at Radio City Music Hall. All the European countries said exactly the same thing, almost at exactly the same time, the United States. Our media were saying the same thing. The bought and paid for generals were saying the same thing. The enemy was saying the same thing. Okay, they'll be done. 300 missiles. Take a victory lap, Israel. Take a victory lap. The purpose of this coordinated propaganda campaign was to prevent Israel from pulverizing Iran's military capabilities. This was not urban warfare, ladies and gentlemen, like Gaza. Israel has one of the most powerful air forces on the face of the earth. Not one of the biggest, one of the most powerful. And it has significantly advanced technical military systems. So the Biden regime began leaking immediately to their favorite reporters. This guy, Barik Raviv, who's an Israeli, writes for Axios and others. I'm going to hand him, Mr. Producer, the Head Up Biden's Ass Award. Because he's their go-to guy. There's a few others, too, when they want to put information out, and he's more than happy to do it for them. So they began leaking immediately to their favorite reporters and media outlets, many of the same press sympathizers, 
they relied on during the Obama regime to promote the Iran nuclear deal. And so they were leaking that Israel had provoked Iran by taking out seven of its generals, including Soleimani's replacement, who was in Syria in a phony consulate building, which was actually an Iranian bunker, directing attacks on Israel and weapons transfers to Israel, against Israel. And was involved in the October 7 attacks of the Israeli Sarah. We're taking this bastard out. So the leaking was Israel had provoked Iran and they hadn't told the U.S. in advance about the planned attack. Why do you think? Because they leaked to the New York Times and this guy Barack Ravid, who's a self-hating Israeli, I guess. They can't trust Biden and Blinken. That's why. Israel didn't forewarn Blinken because he would have leaked it to the media. And Israel's not obliged to get permission from Biden on how and whether to defend its people. Biden and Blinken are hostile to Israel and seek to overthrow its democratic government. There they are. Netanyahu should have told us. Well, they've organized and helped fund his overthrow. Not that of the head of Iran or Turkey. No, Israel. They've repeatedly told this openly to the entire world, including the Iranians that they want to take out the leadership in Israel. Every one of these shocking and appalling Biden regime mobster tactics, and there are more, with the scheming and the plotting and the leaking and the usurping and the backstabbing against a long time and a central loyal ally, which is in a daunting and bloody war, literally triggered by the insane policies of the Biden regime, is beneath contempt. And I found out something else when I was there from one of the horse's mouths. Although they're quiet about it, Israel took out most of the missiles, mostly uh, most of the supersonic missiles. Israel has an extraordinarily advanced and elaborate air defense system. No air defense system is perfect. And I want to explain this to you. The whole SDI idea, the Strategic Defense Initiative, came from Ronald Reagan. It was called SDI, the Strategic Defense Initiative. The media immediately started calling it Star Wars. Let me know when you send that to me, Mr. Producer. Are oh, you having trouble with it? Immediately started calling it uh, Star Wars and mocking it. And one of the leading senators who was mocking it was Joe Biden. Reagan used to talk about the ability to shoot a bullet out of the air with another bullet. That was the goal. Oh, Star Wars, that's a fantasy. And on at least one occasion, he shut down the government because they so slashed funding for what became the Patriot Missile System and its and his efforts to have it, you know, work through and actually go through the practices of seeing if it worked that he put his foot down. The Democrat Party opposed SDI and the Patriot Missile System. They opposed it. They fought it. The media opposed it. They fought it. They mocked Reagan over and over again. Oh, Star Wars. Oh, we're wasting tens of billions when we could be feeding the hungry. Oh, oh, you know how it goes. But he demanded it. He insisted it on it. It also won the Cold War because Gorbachev wet himself over it. Oh, good God. What do they have there? And all through the reporting on the fantastic performance of the missiles shooting down missiles not once did Ronald Reagan get any credit and not once was it mentioned that Joe Biden in 1986 as Henninger writes at the Wall Street Journal mocked as quote reckless the idea of defending against ballistic missiles reckless that was Biden Biden was trying to sabotage the whole program I want you to keep that in mind. So some of this that took place on that Saturday night when we were in Israel was choreographed. Including the propaganda. Including the propaganda. That's not to say it's not a magnificent technological display that we should be proud of and the Israelis should be proud. That's not my point. 
My point is you have the Biden administration through Blinken that has been a special pleader for Iran, that's been funding Iran, that hired this guy Mali, who hired other people back during us, helping, helping Iran get a nuclear weapon. And they still are, and they have no plan to stop it. They won't even let the Israelis stop it. No offensive acts against Iran, because I guarantee you that's what they had in mind. I don't know it for a fact, but I'm sure it was. Now's the time that they would have gotten no backup from the United States. That's why I'm convinced. Unless Israel does it itself, which is very difficult, they're going to get a nuclear weapon. And when they get one, they'll have ten. And when they have ten, they'll have a hundred and one. Because Biden won't even let the Israelis take it out. Then I got to thinking a little bit more, ladies and gentlemen, while I'm over there. This is David versus Goliath. This is not Israel versus Hamas, although Hamas needs to be destroyed and crushed in a thousand different ways. This isn't Israel versus Hezbollah. Same thing. I'm certainly not downplaying it. That's not my point. This is Israel versus Iran. This is David. That's Israel versus Goliath, which is Iran. Iran has probably 12 to 15 times a larger population as Israel. They have more tanks than Israel. They have slowly surrounded Israel with surrogate terrorist regimes armed with missiles up the wazoo. Israel is David. Iran's Goliath. Israel's the victim. Iran is the perpetrator. That's the war that's taking place. Iran's direct attack on Israel with over 300 missiles makes it crystal clear. Israel is David. Iran is Goliath. Iran has surrounded Israel with terrorist surrogates that are relentlessly, daily, attacking the Jewish state. The Biden administration has funded Iran. It's rearmed Iran. Iran is on the precipice of completing its nuclear missile development with no U.S. plan to stop them. No offensive activity. Not by Israel, no. Take a victory lap. It's over. And helping Iran, Goliath, against Israel, David, is unbelievable act of duplicity and betrayal by the Biden regime. And the Biden regime is now threatening to abandon Israel if it retaliates against Iran to deter further offensive military attacks against its cities and its towns. In fact, the Biden regime demands that Israel declare victory in a suicide act of self-deception and has organized a PR campaign I keep talking about really against Israel. Israel's going to retaliate how and when We don't know. They can't stand for this. Of course, Biden stands for it. That's fine. But Israel's not required to join Biden's suicide pact, which he's dragging our country down. They're not required to force to join us. We could only wish we had a leader like Netanyahu rather than any sinister and moronic schemer like Biden. That is a fact. That is a fact. Now, I'm not going to come on this radio program and tell you things that didn't happen when we were there. That we were sheltering and we were shivering and the missiles flew right over our heads. And that, No, although the missiles came pretty damn close flew flying over the hotel, but that's beside the point. You're a little nervous, but at no point was I or were my family scared. At no point were we in direct danger. That's, of course, one of those things would have hit the hotel directly. I'm no hero. I'm not Superman. I went there to see with my own two eyes what the hell is going on so I could report back to you. The truth. The truth. The fact is that there was this choreography to a point that took place. The fact is that Iran does fear a massive strike from Israel. The fact is that our government has been working around the back of we the people and deceived us on how it's supporting Iran. It's supporting Iran in every respect. And the fact is that our government 
is on the wrong side of a lot of these battles. And when you have a guy like Blinken, who's a Marxist ideologue, whose family has ties to Soros, and this is not hyperbole, these are facts. And they listen to a buffoon like Thomas Friedman, who's wrong all the time. You can see what danger we're in and what danger they put another country in. The difference is, the Israelis, I said, have nowhere to go. That's their home. And they're going to fight for it. And they didn't elect Biden. They didn't elect Blinken. And if it means not getting support from the United States, they're still going to fight for it. They have no choice. Mark Levin. You're listening to the best of Mark Levin. I posted for you a opening statement I gave on life, liberty, and Levin in February, laying out the entire impeachment issue, which, of course, is relevant to this moment. And if you want one of the best books ever written about impeachment, I would argue it's the best book ever written about impeachment without having to go through Madison's notes and all the rest of it. I encourage you to check out Raul Berger's 1973 book, Impeachment, The Constitutional Problems. He was a professor at Harvard Law School. He was a friend with Robert Bork over a period of time. And as he explains, and as I will summarize, and as I explained at length on my Fox show, which is why I linked it on my social sites, high crimes and misdemeanors have nothing to do with a criminal code. There was no criminal code before there was a constitution. There was no federal government at the time. So when I hear these former federal prosecutors, or whomever they are, defense counsel, go on about what impeachment means, unless you really study it, you really don't know. And they go all the way back to the 1300s, the English common law, to the practices subsequently by the parliament, vis-a-vis the king, what sorts of things were impeachable, what sorts of things weren't. This is how the framers studied these things. This is how they looked at them. And the Berger's view, and I agree with them, when you look at the citations and go over them yourself, is that high crimes and misdemeanors refer to political crimes against the state. That is, if you're a senior officer, say, in the federal government, once they set it up, the national government, and um, you are attacking the body politic, you are attacking the culture, you're attacking now the Constitution, you are doing things that bring significant, if not grave, consequences against the body politic, that's an impeachable offense. There had to be a way to deal with that. Now, they were also concerned about Congress blackmailing a president. Remember, they were creating all this, all these offices and so forth. So they rejected what's called maladministration. High crimes and misdemeanors was added. So it's a level above maladministration. And again, you can look at Madison's notes. There's other notes, too, at the convention. They're much more sporadic. Uh, but Madison took the time to actually take notes, extensive notes, and he, never, he didn't release them until uh, 50 years after the Constitutional Convention. So we get a lot of insight there. We get insight from the Federalist Papers. But the most insight we get is who they rely on. So when you think of it, a high crime and misdemeanor more as a political attack or a political violation or a political crime, if you will, against the state, against the people. So when Mitt Romney comes out and he says things like, these articles don't have impeachable offenses in them, he reveals himself as an idiot. Article 1 that was sent over to the Senate, I've read them before to you, they're quite involved, I won't read them again, dealt with the multiple occasions and sections of federal immigration law that Mayorkas violated. 
And there's many of them. And they spell it out. They spell out his actions. They spell out what the statute says. Because the president and his underlings, they all take an oath to uphold the Constitution. And that involves, as the Supreme Court has ruled, but as the Constitution says in the executive branch, is to take care that the laws are administered, that they're executed. It's called the take care clause. So if you don't do that, and even worse, if you undermine them, this is an ironclad impeachment case. Ironclad. And then the second article deals with the occasions in which Mayorkas repeatedly lied to committees of Congress. Operational control over the border, the borders closed, and on and on and on. You're not free to keep going to Congress and changing your story or lying and all the rest of it. As to whether or not Biden should have been impeached, or what, what has nothing to do with the other, despite the best efforts of some constitutional illiterates to say otherwise, they all take an oath. They all have an obligation. And so if the Republican House, which is a tiny majority, and they have a few reprobates, reprobates decides that it's easier to deal with my orcas and make the point and deal with it than Biden, that's a prudent decision. There's nothing irrational or contradictory that's a prudent decision do what you can do it's like abortion do what you can do fight what you can fight get some wins save some lives it's the nature of the beast and so what happened today is another nail in the coffin of our constitutional system I hear a Chad, I forget his last name on Fox, who's really quite a brilliant guy. He's like the rain man when it comes to uh, Congress's procedures. But this wasn't about Congress's procedures. Pergman, Chad Pergman. I don't know him, but he's obviously quite good. I'm just saying, to me, the focus was, should have been on the attack on the Constitution. This may not be his, an area he knows. He knows the process. And by the way, as I said, he is superb. <clears throat> that said, this isn't about process. What's the purpose of the impeachment clause? The House has a duty and the Senate has a duty. The House impeaches, the Senate tries. I searched everything I have and everything I know to find out where there is authority for the Senate not to hold a trial. It doesn't exist. Then we get into what's a trial. Well, we know what a trial is. We've had impeachment trials. That's what an impeachment trial is. We have precedent from way back. We don't have to reinvent the wheel and start playing word games, do we? That's a trial. Well, in criminal trials, you could just say it's not a criminal trial. It's a constitutional trial. Now, what else? You have a very high bar for convicting somebody in the Senate. You need two-thirds. You need 67 senators. So the impeachment of a president hasn't succeeded yet. So people, why then why impeach him? I don't know. Why did they impeach Andrew Johnson? Because he was slow walking the uh, reconstruction. People are sympathetic to him. I'm not sympathetic to him at all, by the way. But that has nothing to do with anything either. The House has a job, and that's not to play Nostradamus and figure out the consequences. That's their job. So what did the Senate do today? Nothing. They took the impeachment articles, made a mockery of the entire process, were cheered by the media and their party, and destroyed another provision of the Constitution, one that's crucially important. The impeachment clause was the second most debated issue after the office of the presidency that they finally created. They spent a lot of time on it. They wanted to get it right, and they did get it right for the most part. So if you can send impeachment articles to the Senate about a, an official in a Democrat administration, and that Senate is 5149 Democrat, the precedent now is it doesn't have to take it up, really. It can pretend to take it up. Why? Why? I want you to listen to this, because it's not being explained properly. 
anywhere. Chuck Schumer himself and by himself decided that Article 1 and Article 2 were unconstitutional. Based on what grounds? No grounds. Well, what did they debate? What did they? No debate allowed. Some Republicans tried to engage in a debate. They were cut off. Because they have rules. <coughs> excuse me. Rules from 30 years ago or so that they put in place. I think they said 1983. That you can't. <coughs> excuse me. You can't debate these things during a trial. You're a jury. Oh, those rules will follow, but the Constitution, we won't. The framers never contemplated that the Senate wouldn't take up the case and hold a trial. So what did Schumer do? He said, Article 1 is unconstitutional. Then he puts it up to a vote. And of course, 51 to 48 to 1. There's Lisa Murkowski. But all 51 Democrats, boy, those heels are clicking. Those knees are high in the air as they march one behind the next. And so they ruled that Article 1 is unconstitutional without any debate, without any discussion. And then we hear, but Schumer offered them a one hour on each article. Schumer's not the king. What do you mean he offered them? A trial is supposed to take place. So if a bare majority of 51 can decide they're not going to take up this article or that article because their leader declares they're unconstitutional, that's now the end of it. That's it. It's over. Is that why the framers spent all this time on the impeachment clause? Of course not. And if they'd spent all this time on the impeachment clause, if they thought there would be an out, something short of a trial, wouldn't somebody had said something? Yes, but they didn't. But if you're so corrupt, if you lack any drop of virtue, and you take the Constitution and you twist it, there's nobody who can fix that. Well, take it to court. The court doesn't get involved in impeachments. Nor should it. Court's not always right. Keep handing it to these potentates, to this Politburo. Why? Chuck Schumer just destroyed the impeachment clause. Chuck Schumer was behind. He was the guy pushing for filibustering federal appellate court nominees. He destroyed the appointment process, the, the process that the Senate uses to give its okay or not. He destroyed it with the filibuster. <laughs> Schumer did. They tried to destroy the 14th Amendment and use it to drag their agenda into the 14th Amendment by eliminating ballot sp- spots for Trump. But we had to go through that for months, even though it was insane. And even the Supreme Court saw it, although three justices were wobbly, the usual Marxists. So why were Article 1 and Article 2 unconstitutional? We don't know. Policy, they were involved. No, they weren't. It had nothing to do with policy. They laid out the case. You had to be Helen Keller not to see it. So they protected their boy, Mayorkas. And it was even worse. They wouldn't even have a final vote to dismiss. They just voted that Article One's unconstitutional, Article Two's unconstitutional. Case closed. Do you see that, Mr. Producer? Case closed. It's over. Not even a vote to dismiss. No, it's over. Done. Forget it. Mark Levin. The Great One makes your weekend even better. This is the best of Mark Levin. And we have an obligation to each other to leave no one behind, to give hate no safe harbor. It's up to all of us to preserve and protect the very idea of America. Mm. You know, we're unique. We're unique in American world history. We're the only nation founded on an idea. Every other nation in the world is found on geography, ethnicity, race, religion. Can we stop there a minute? Marxism is an idea. There's a lot of nations that have been founded on Marxism. 
But anyway, go ahead. Think about it. The idea was we hold these truths to be self-evident. But all mm. men and women are created equal in the image of God, deserve to be treated equally throughout their lives. We've never fully lived up to it, but we've Actually, never Actually, that's not what the Declaration it. says, and I don't know what you mean we never fully lived up to it. You are a disgusting reprobate. You walk into the Senate, you side with the segregationists and the racists, and then you attack your fellow citizens that we never lived up to it. I don't even know what that means, we never looked up, uh, lived up to it. We fought a civil war to end slavery. That's how the Republican Party was founded, to fight the Democrat Party, the slavery party. We had civil rights battles throughout the history of this country. The latest in the 50s and 60s into the 70s, led by the black churches in the South, not by the white liberal Democrats in the North. And we're so good at equality now, we've moved on to equity. We don't even talk about equality anymore, we talk about equity. Civil rights Marxism. I'm so sick and tired of this old coot going around yammering away, trashing our country, undermining our democracy, a.k.a. republicanism, and then going around and making the comments that he makes. Now, I want to delve into some issues here. The Speaker of the House will be on this program in the third hour. He's requested to come on, and I'm going to give him an airing. I also want to talk about who are the conservatives? What is the conservative movement? Are they effective? Are they actually getting anything done? What are they getting done? I know they go on TV a lot. (laughs) I know they go on the radio a lot. Tell us what they would do and what we should do, and I respond to each one of them. I get many of them texting me. Okay. Well, if these things can be done, these things can be done. Why aren't we doing them? It's the leadership's problem. Oh, okay. It's the leadership's problem. No, it's not so simple as that. A thousand ideas. Everybody has ideas. You ever sit at a dinner table and you have an uncle or somebody, or you hear somebody say, I've got an idea for X, Y, Z. Do you ever say, okay, so why don't you put it into action? Well, this rule, and this guy, and all this is going on, and this one won't listen to me. These are losers. Losers. I grew up in the era of statesmen. And we knew statesmen when we saw them. And we fought like hell for Ronald Reagan in the 1976 primary, and we lost. Then we fought like hell in 1980. I was a very young guy in Pennsylvania. Then we won. Then we won. By today's standard, Reagan would be a moderate, maybe even a liberal. But he wouldn't be a loser. Massively grew the economy, massively slashed taxes, massively increased defense spending, destroyed the Soviet Union. Pretty good record, and I'm just getting started. But he didn't get everything he wants. That's for sure. He wanted to slash spending. He did everything he could, but he he couldn't stop it. He stopped some of it. In fact, he stopped a lot of it. But he couldn't stop all of it. And I'll get to that later. Spare Don, a friend of mine, I get attacked when I say we ought to defend our allies and we ought to send them arms so they can defend themselves as well. That now is the definition, apparently, of a warmonger. No, it's not. Just because we have our own factions and our own mobs who insist on it doesn't make it true. The vast majority of the American people want us to have the strongest defense on the face of the earth. The vast majority of the American people do not support Vladimir Putin against the Ukrainians. The vast majority of the Americans do not support communist China against Taiwan. 
The vast majority of Americans, over 80 percent, the last survey, do not support Iran and the Islamo-Nazis against Israel. The vast majority of the American people are smart. They have common sense. They love their country. And they know there's evil. There's enemies out there, whether it's Marxists or Islamists or whatever ists they call themselves. Evil doesn't take a break. Evil doesn't go away. Evil doesn't care if we have a ceasefire. We back off. We pull in our trunk. They don't care. We've only tried that repeatedly in this country, and it led to World War II. The Japanese attacking Pearl Harbor way far away. Oh, Hawaii so far away. Wasn't even a state. What's the problem? It's so far away. Here we are in the United States of America, continental America. Churchill. They talk about his years in the wilderness. 1930s, for 10 years. He was ignored by the establishment. He was ignored by fellow conservatives. In fact, worse, he was mocked. And he studied Germany. He studied 18th century, first Duke of Marlborough, his uncle, and the battle. The battles that took place. He studied German militarism. And he warned to anybody who would listen, which was nobody, when the Third Reich came on the scene, he warned them this is war. He's a warmonger. I guess back then they might have even called him a neocon. A globalist. Germany was building up its military machine. He warned them. He said, this is aimed at us. No, 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 no. Germany wouldn't think about it. They're too weak. There's too many countries that they would have to invade in order to get to our island nation. Nobody's going to touch our island nation. We have the uh, canal. It's getting worse. He warned his fellow Brits again. We must prepare for war. Now. They dismissed him. Just easier to dismiss him. Besides, it's very expensive, you know. We have to balance our budget and all kinds of stuff. He said, no. Prepare for war. War is coming. And whether we like it or not. Even when he was eventually chosen as prime minister, he was the default choice. The default choice. They didn't rally around him. Neville Chamberlain's appeasement failed. Diplomacy, as Biden calls it in Blinken. Diplomacy. Churchill said, you don't understand the mindset. You don't understand the mindset of the Germans, he said. Biden doesn't understand the mindset of the Islamist terrorists. Or the Marxist Chinese. He doesn't get the mindset. Diplomacy is something to use as a tool against your enemies. We being the enemy. You know who is a student of Churchill, who's read everything he can get his hands on? Who's talked to some of the historians that have written the best books about Churchill, many of whom are no longer with us? Netanyahu. He's effectively a Churchill historian, self-taught. And by the way, brilliant man, he went to MIT, master's degree, I'm not talking about that. He's very familiar with Churchill. Biden's not familiar with anything. Many people who attack me have no knowledge whatsoever of history. Zero. Only 80 years ago, 90 years ago, American history and the lead up to World War II. They don't have the foggiest idea. But they've learned slogans. I'm embarrassed to say. Warmonger, neocon, Zionist. They've learned slogans. 
And yet when the history books are written, it's going to be about those citizens, you, who stand up to this and say no. No. China is doing what China is doing because they want to destroy us. Russia is doing what Russia is doing because they want to destroy us. Iran and the Islamists are doing what they're doing overseas and in our own country because they want to destroy us. And here we dither over the speakership. Five hundred years from now, nobody's going to know what a speaker is. They're certainly not going to know who all these folks are who are going to remove the next speaker and and have a debate over this statute and that statute, and we tied it to this and we tied it to that, and I told them what to do, and they won't listen to what I said. I ask every one of these guys, truly, because I want to support them. If you're right, Why can't you get it done? Nobody will listen to me. Then that's a problem. That's your problem. That's what a statesman is all about. Leading and persuading. Not whining and complaining. And I've had about enough of it. That's not how I grew up under a father and a mother. Get off your backside and do something about it. Don't keep complaining and whining. These are the great men and women of history. Fill in the blank wouldn't let me do it. I don't understand. If these ideas are so good and they're so strong, why can't you get people to support you? Why can't you get anything done? Because right now, we conservatives are getting nothing done. Zero. And we're pointing fingers all over the place. And to expect the American people to rally around us was such a record, was such statements with such commentary is absurd. Churchill's campaign against appeasement. Cambridge University Press, for much of the decade prior to 1940, Churchill was out of the office and often seen as a warmonger. That was the reputation that they projected upon him. He hated war. He'd been in wars. He fought in wars. He hated it. But that doesn't mean you pretend it's not building. And that doesn't mean we pretend it's not building against us. And when you wait too late, the consequences are dire. And in the modern era, with new technologies and weapons that can literally blow up the planet, dithering is not an answer. Churchill's sole appeasement is a policy not befitting a country of Britain standing that, stating that they failed to take account of innate German militarism. Innate German militarism. Innate communist Chinese militarism. Innate Russian militarism. Innate Islamo-Nazi Islamist militarism. All three of them are staring us in the face. Mark Levin. We're giving you nothing but the best, the best of Mark Levin. I'm watching what this judge is doing to Donald Trump. He's trying to humiliate him now, this courtroom. This is a puny, local elected Democrat hack judge who should have dismissed this outrageous case a long time ago. Issues a gag order, makes provocative statements directed, directed at the former president, He's moving at breakneck speed. You know, picking juries, uh, normally it doesn't take three days. It takes a long time. He should have recused. He should have moved the uh, 
the venue to another location, but he hasn't done anything because he doesn't want to. And so this is a setup. All these cases are set up. And that includes the document case. I'm sorry, I disagree with the other legal analysts on this issue. I think that's another outrage, particularly given what Biden did and he gets a pass. I've spent my life studying history, especially American history. My family has fought for this country. We are great patriots that go back many generations. I've had family members tell stories about their histories. We thank God for America. As a young teenager, my buddy Eric and I would repeatedly go to Independence Hall, study as much as we could about America's founding, the Declaration, the Constitution, and everything in between and around. This has been my life. Radio, TV, book writing. No. No. Understanding liberty. Power. Understanding what makes man tick. Why America, of all the places, since the beginning of mankind, was the place blessed by God to be the greatest nation on the face of the earth. The men who did it, the men who fought for it and died for it, the Revolutionary War, brave, brave men. Brave, brave men. Every war thereafter, every battle thereafter, to preserve what? To preserve America. And I'm sitting here and watching this take place in Manhattan, just as we watched what Letitia James did, just as we watched what Fannie Willis has done, just as we watched what Jack Smith has done and Merrick Garland has done, just as we watch all these corrupt, ideologically driven judges, the press, I wrote an entire book on the history of the press in America. Completely corrupted, tyrannical, a one-party press. I've studied thoroughly the Democrat Party. That's my last book, The Democrat Party Hates America. I come to the conclusion because it is a party that has never, ever, ever accepted the American experiment. Party of slavery and segregation and Jim Crow and eugenics. Now the party of Marxism and Islamism and anti-Semitism. I see what's happening. You see what's happening. Maximum interference with this election, just as there was maximum attempts at a coup against Trump from the moment he got elected, even before he got elected. The FBI, our intelligence agencies, unleashed under Obama and Biden to take out a presidential candidate? Funded by the Hillary Clinton campaign? A ruling class that is self-serving, contemptible, and incompetent, except when it comes to defending their own largesse and power? We have an open border. That's man-made. That is destroying our country. Our public school systems have been destroyed by the Democrat Party and their unions. The nuclear family, morality, ethics, parental rights, all under attack. All on defense. Women's sports destroyed. The civil rights movement being taken over by the civil rights Marxist movement, a.k.a. civil rights Marxism.
We see in the blue states efforts to use the 14th Amendment to prevent Donald Trump from even being on the ballot. That's a first. Regardless of what anybody says. In the 2020 presidential election, we saw secretaries of state, Democrat governors, Democrat county commissioners, Democrat precinct workers and ward leaders change elections, change the rules. Held up by the courts, Democrat courts, to prevent voter ID, voter signatures, dates on absentee ballots to permit voter harvesting, that is counting votes after the fact. And I'm supposed to sit here and say it's all perfectly normal. As the greatest country on the face of the earth is being devoured by the American Marxists and their party, the Democrat Party, with the full-throated support of their corrupt media. Now let me say this, and I mean it. It'll be taken out of context, and I don't really care. I will never support, ever, ever, the election of Joe Biden as President of the United States. I will never support it, ever. As we watch, they destroy the justice system. Democrat judges, Democrat Soros prosecutors. I will never, ever acknowledge Joe Biden as President of the United States when those numbers come in any more than they have accepted Donald Trump as President of the United States the first time around or, God willing, should he win this time around. They're already preparing the riots. They're already preparing the resistance movements. They're already preparing more impeachments. They're already preparing criminal investigations. They started it. And they have no intention of stopping it. The Democrat Party threw in with the slave owners. It represented them. It fought for them during the Civil War. It hasn't changed. It just changes uniforms from time to time. The Democrat Party is a thoroughly Jew-hating, anti-Semitic party today. It is a party that abuses black voters in this country. It is a party that abuses Hispanic voters in this country. It is a party that uses minorities and then throws them away after the election cycle is done. It is a party that does not believe in freedom, private property rights, the principles enshrined in the Declaration, our founding document, It's a party that believes in economic socialism and cultural Marxism. It's a party that embraces Islamicism, Hamas, the PLO, Iran. It's a party who keeps promoting a man for President of the United States who has sold out to the Communist Chinese. It's a party that hates law enforcement, local law enforcement. It is a radical extremist party, an umbrella entity for all the miscreants and malcontents and reprobates in this society. It destroys, it doesn't build. It burns, it doesn't develop. Takes peace in the Middle East and turns it into war. It takes good race relations that had taken place in this country and shreds it. There is no way in hell that I could ever accept Joe Biden as president. You see what's happening at Columbia University. It's happening again today. It happened yesterday. Joe Biden hasn't said a word. Joe Biden hasn't said a word about anti-Semitism in the last many months. Why? Because his party's funding it. Dark money. 
Dark money. Who the hell do you think's paying for those tents, for those signs, for the websites, for the organizations? Multi-billionaires, Democrats, through dark money organizations that operate in the shadows and then fund other groups. We know this for a fact. And by the way, I will expose it in great detail over the weekend. I've spent morning, noon, and night working on this. You need to see it. I've told you before, if you hate Israel, you hate America. If you hate America, you hate Israel. And that's exactly what's going on in the streets. Suddenly, light bulbs are going off after you and I have talked about this for month after month after month after month. You're seeing a fusion of American Marxists and Islamists. That's what you're seeing. Obama could not import enough people from the Middle East into this country. Look it up. The border is wide open now to fundamentally, fundamentally alter this nation. Not because of people of color and all the rest of that crap. Because they are importing different cultural beliefs into this country. People that have no ties to the American founding. People that have no ties to the Constitution. Representative government, all the rest. They've destroyed the methodologies by which we assimilate people into this country. Our public schools and our colleges. That's the way we assimilated people into this country. And people are coming into this country from every corner of the earth who have no ties and want no ties to the American culture. It's a sure way to destroy America. And they know it. And Democrats of the past knew it. Ralph Abernathy, Martin Luther King's right-hand man, he knew it. Cesar Chavez, the head of the Farm Workers Union, he knew it. Walter Mondale, Eugene McCarthy, they knew it. Arthur Schlesinger Jr., he knew it. Governor Dick Lamb of Colorado, he knew it. Everybody knows it. But God forbid if you stand up to it, or any of this, the reason Donald Trump is facing a Soviet-style relentless, multiple prosecution in four different jurisdictions at exactly the same time with 91 charges is because he dared to stand up to it. Christie didn't stand up to it. Haley didn't stand up to it. Hogan didn't stand up to it. Romney didn't stand up to it. They're part of it. Because Trump stood up to it. I don't care whether you like him or like all his policies. He's paying the price. They're destroying his businesses. They're bankrupting him. They're trying to put him in prison. 91 charges in four different jurisdictions, three of which are massively Democrat. What's the likelihood you come out of that unscathed? With Democrat elected hack judges and Democrat appointed hack judges in Washington. This isn't an insurrection. The insurrection's over by the Democrat Party. This is punishment now. Punishment. 